Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel, The Misconceptions About NFTs and Digital Assets. So, like the name says, today we're going to actually clear a little bit these misconceptions and also speak about how investors can take advantage of NFTs and digital assets in their investment strategies, especially in the current market conditions. But before we start the panel, I want to take the chance to, for us to introduce ourselves. I can start with myself. My name is Maria Eneva Olms, and I'm based in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm the founder and CEO of Ecolens, and Ecolens is a Web3 recruitment platform. We train people in different blockchain professions, such as solidity developers, marketers, community managers, content creators for blockchain. And then we connect them to blockchain companies where they can find jobs. I would like to ask my fellow panelists to also introduce themselves. Lovely, thank you. I'm Farbud Sadigian, founder of RTQ. It's an investment capital for NFTs, and we also enable a lot of uh, traditional art move into NFTs with tokenization and uh, different type of aspects. I will explain a little bit afterwards. And we are also trying to create security assets, bankable NFTs for the projects that which we are involved in. Hi everyone, I'm Ricky Hira, I'm the marketing director for Bit.com. Uh, Bit.com is actually a crypto trading platform where we provide spot uh, futures trading as well as crypto options trading. Uh, we've been around since August 2020 and if you guys have visited our booth, um, you'll, you'll see that you'll get to learn uh, what we do and something really cool about us uh, and I hope you guys uh, will enjoy the panel today. Thank you, so let's start. Um, after we had a fantastic 2021 with the raise of NFTs, blockchain gaming, uh, DeFi further expanding, uh, we had a little bit of a harsher reality this year with the so-called crypto winter. So let me give you some statistics what that really means. So the crypto market lost over 55% of its market cap which is a loss of over 1.2 trillion US dollars, according to data from CoinMarketCap. This, of course, affected the NFT prices as well. And according to CoinGecko, the blue chip NFT collections lost over 70% of their price. So in such market conditions, it's kind of hard for investors to react. So my first question uh, would be, what options do investors have in crypto winter um, when prices are dropping? Ricky. Okay, well, um, I guess in this uh, market, it's not really the best time to go crazy and uh, try to jump into getting whatever's the next hype coin or token that's, that's coming out. And I think people need to understand that it's more about analyzing their portfolios, uh, managing their expectations, are looking at the limitations within uh, the scope of what, what they are working with and also to understand that um, if they want to really diversify at this time, they should do it smartly, uh, take a step back, always be calm, relax, uh, don't panic and make sure that uh, you're making informed decisions. Thank you, Ricky. And can we maybe somehow bring traditional investment formats into the digital world, Farbot? Okay, that was actually our main issue when we started to launch our token uh, around a year ago. We talked with a lot of investors. The first question always from traditional or conventional investors was, what is the security, how I buy it? We faced a lot of issues also that they are not allowed to uh, invest into cryptos like family offices and others. Uh, what had happened that it changed a lot our strategies, we tried to create a fiat investment fund separate than what we were doing. Going through the legislation and the rules to create an investment fund and, and, uh, and as a uh, non-tokenized was that we need again to go to a lot of countries that they offer those services. What we changed, we created an ISIN, a normal security investment code. We did it in Switzerland with two companies. Actually, 
now people can also invest with fiat in their own portfolio, like as they are trading stock or investing in any other uh, any other financial product. They, they just go to their bank and they say, we want to have RTQ, and that's what we are launching now. Uh, the underlying, they pay with fiat, the underlying asset is the tokens. The tokens goes to a custodial uh, holder, and the bank actually drags the prices from our own API or coin market cap or the other official APIs. This product as a financial, traditional financial product for investment solved a lot of our issues. At this moment, we are getting a lot of family offices, institutionals that they are investing with our platform because they didn't want to go directly in a token economics. And I think to create or connect the whole uh, traditional way of doing investment with what is happening in the crypto world would help us all. And that's what we are recommending to our partners. We have created a few groups that we are supporting everyone how we do it. If anybody has questions on that, you can always drop us an email and we at least tell you with which companies because it took us seven months to get approvals from Swiss banking system to bring this product on the market. Now we did it, and then if any questions, please drop me an email. <clears throat> My email would be fs at rtq.io. Anytime I will be uh, happy to be able to support. Great, I think um, it's a very interesting product what you created there. And I also know that you come from the traditional art world or this is your interest. So let's combine again like the traditional world with digital world. How can tokenization um, allow investment in the traditional art world? Uh, we have a great kind of success story that we find it a lot as a success. A lot of people still are saying we didn't sell the 10,000 tokens, uh, 10,000 pieces. Uh, we started last year with the museum uh, in Austria. It's called Belvedere Museum. Uh, we took one of their masterpieces, it's the uh, Gustav Klimt, The Kiss, and we tokenized to 10,000 uh, pieces. It means they are fractional ownership. Everybody were saying, why you're doing that, or, or what, is the, what is the economics behind? The problem is with NFT market, everybody thinks that I need to jump in in a project that is a lot of engagement in it, and I increase my price and then exit it or, or make money with it. But everybody forgets the concept of art, because for me as a uh, lover of what Gustav Klimt did, and is, is a one-time chance that this piece is getting digitalized and tokenized, for me, uh, I would love to own a piece and to hold it as a long term, because never in traditional art, art would increase prices by a few hundred percent. Our, our aspect of looking at NFTs and digital art or traditional art in NFTs, I think we need to also change our point of view. What we also seen with the kids, uh, it was really cool that kids would buy the NFT and they would go to the museum in front of the original piece that is normally not easy to get the kids to go to the museum. And they were making selfies with their piece in the hand that I own a piece of this beautiful masterpiece. And we see that we need to do much more to traditional art too through our digital NFTs because that's the way to enable people to own a piece. A lot of the young investors in NFT field, they were asking us in our Discord that was new to us too, uh, that what is, who is Gustav Klimt? And then for me, like, okay, guys, where we start with? Now the, the game is getting much more tough. We handed over the Discord first to some of our uh, senior staff, and they were like, how should I answer that? And now we are very happy that we have a young team taking care of it. I, I cannot follow with the Discord messages. I would get really mad after half an hour. But a lot of questions came in. We see that there is a missing connection between the NFTs that they are enabling art to live more or enabling artists to live. We had the corona time. Uh, none of the artists was able to sell. We own few galleries in Europe and we didn't have any events. It was two years off, nobody sold art. It was really tough to sell art. And most of them, they created their NFTs and they were surviving on it. It means connecting the traditional artists 
and even museums, what we did now, we are extremely happy that people are still talking about the project, buying uh, uh, unique editions. Uh, we were last week also in uh, New York, NYC NFT. It was shocking that we didn't see anything traditional there. Everything was the very nice projects. Uh, we loved the new projects. But where are the galleries? Where are the uh, museums? And I think if we, as the community of people that have stepped in already into crypto, I'm more talking about myself, uh, then we need to enable that, that everybody understands how to use digital art to support artists, support museums. We sold uh, nearly 5 million euro for, uh, till now for the Belvedere Museum. It's a great money for them because they were also not selling any tickets and now they have another extra 5 million in the, in the budget. They are most probably getting new art or whatever they're doing with it. And those are the things that I think the connection would be great. And we in RTQ, uh, we try to be the bridge and try to find solutions to do this better. I love this, that you're actually discussing on Discord about the artists and the real art and not about what are NFTs and yeah, how do I get a wallet? How do I sell an NFT? I love that you turned the conversation around into the traditional world and the history of art and what is real art about. I love that. Thank you, but it's not far away because our digital artists are also artists. They have their, their playground into now the, the metaverse a lot, a lot of digital tools. They are always in our cell phone, but why not the other artists also using it? I, I hate it when we go to galleries and they're like, oh, these NFT people, what NFT people? There is the, it's just a new way of looking at the art. And we, we, we have a lot it's a of- It's a tool, yeah, it's, it's a, a tool. It's a tool for everyone. It's, it's not only for art, it's for collectibles, tools for everything. When I was a kid, we were collecting books, uh, collectible uh, car pictures or football, whatever, FIFA stuff. Now we are doing it differently, and, and I really want to uh, try to get this, uh, this barrier between the digital and, the, and the somehow offline art to, be, to go away, because it's, it's just a good tool for everyone, and, and it's a long-term good investment. Yeah. And Ricky, can you tell us what are the main misconceptions when it comes to NFTs? Um, well, uh, the main misconception about NFTs, uh, it always makes me laugh. It's like people think it's like glorified JPEGs of like cartoon monkeys or cats or whatnot. Um, but they, they fail to realize that the technology behind it is actually, there's actually a lot of real world use case scenarios. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like uh, if you heard uh, Alfa Romeo, the car manufacturer, um, actually produced an SUV that um, its, its electronic system is actually tied to the blockchain. So um, people can, it, and it will generate an NFT certificate to, to let people know um, when the car has been serviced, whether it's been serviced properly and on time. And that in itself shows that, um, you see, when you sell the car, it, it actually uh, preserves the value that, um, that of, the, of that vehicle. Whereas uh, I think that's why I feel that the real world use of this uh, NFTs has been lost in translation because if you come back to my initial point, it's beyond, it goes beyond um, just uh, cartoon pictures or art in any form. Even like what Fabon mentioned, real world art, um, that's also something that people uh, see NFTs as, maybe they don't see the value of making traditional art into an NFT, but uh, I think as Fabon mentioned, it brings a, a lot of uh, education to people uh, in, on different um, platforms and channels. Just adding one thing on that, because I get a lot of questions that is really, because we are in the art scene and they say, okay, what is with these punks or what is with these apes? And why they are so valuable and, and what is going on? Sometimes also now I took before the side of the traditional art. Now I want to take also a little bit side of the NFT and digital art. When you have a few hundred million reach with, with a message of the apes that comes out, the world is following. Actually, it's the same with the, with the artists that we have. And when we, when we talk about the great Gustav Klimt, is the reach that makes it so valuable because people know about it. And that's why we say the value is on both sides, whether it's a digital art or is a traditional art, but connecting it would be where it's useful. 
Yeah, definitely. And let's say I own a digital asset, like an NFT. Can I collateralize it or how do I collateralize it and use it as a security? Farbo. Uh, okay, that's something that in any government legislation you ask that they would say no, it's not possible, leave it or whatever. I'm asking how. Yeah, how? it's thousands of documents. Look, it's, it's actually the, the aspect that is changing. If we create security tokens that there is already enough of companies who have the license we applied for one, uh, for one and we have received it after one and a half year. If we try to see NFTs as, as the art, which before we would take it to Switzerland or Liechtenstein and lock it up there and use the documentation to get a loan for a house or a car, uh, we are trying, and it's not only us, a lot of other companies have done extremely great effort for it, that we are doing bankable NFTs. It means when you buy something, you need to get a valuator. The valuator, there's a lot of tools out there, but the reason we are also trying to bring a lot of uh, traditional art, tokenizing it or fractionize it with the ownership of the original art even, is to bring the banks and institutions to accept this as a traditional artwork. Because when first we talked about digital only, they were like, who gonna evaluate it? Now it's much easier, there's thousand tools out there, everything, but still they are not comfortable with. We, have, we are working with three banks that they have been so far very responsive and we are, they are accepting our projects. But we are trying to somehow convince them with owning a digital piece that behind it there is a part of the original piece and why this is different than putting my, my painting in their secure room. It would be the same thing. Then they came up with an idea that they need cold wallets. It means I need to deposit it on a cold wallet, bring it to the bank. Then we agreed upon that too. Uh, it, it went one step further. Now they have a custody wallet because most of the banks has understood the importance of it. Now they are accepting that we just transfer it to their custody wallet and they use it. And I think for all the NFT projects globally, uh, if everybody tries to convince their house banks or people that they're working with them to, to initiate this, that would be the future. And that's where we are also as RTQ looking into to become someday uh, in, in future uh, an NFT bank that people can even borrow or collateralize it with us. That's why we are creating one-to-one -one security tokens out of their NFTs. Okay, understood. But NFTs are not as liquid as, let's say, fiat currency or even cryptocurrency. So is the liquidity an issue? Um, yeah, well, I would say it's definitely an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, however, um, companies need to have a, a proper infrastructure in place and be adaptable um, for NFTs. Because, um, I mean, for example, you could own a portion of my glasses one day maybe. Because it's, the, the technology is crazy and the possibilities are endless. Uh, but it comes back to the point that I feel that companies must make sure that they remain adaptable and have the infrastructure in place so that liquidity becomes less of an issue. Okay, Farbot, what do you think about the liquidity question? Do you think there is an issue with the liquidity of NFTs, especially from an investor's point of view? Because I think I own a couple of NFTs. Um, right now, of course, they're not worth anything. I would like to collateralize them, <laughs> probably. I cannot take a big loan on that. Um, but yeah, what, what other things can I do with my NFTs? Look, is there also, they call it uh, crypto winter, is also NFT winter, yeah. spring coming soon. But Should uh, I wait? Definitely. I, I wouldn't sell anything. I mean, this is like, uh, first of all, look at it as art. You collected it. And one thing, uh, when you have a lot of art piece at home, when you want to sell it, even when you don't have money, I had these issues sometimes. Which one you want to sell? You look at each one of them and say, no, this one not. And tomorrow I would say, maybe that one. And now even if you decide, it was a, it was a time that pop art was, was great and everybody were investing in pop art. I'm sure a lot of people in the crowd, they also invested in it. They bought 5,000 euro of pop art, was, was really cool. But can I sell it? No. And I have a lot of those. It's like, 
You, you love it, you love an art piece, you buy it. It's always, we need to see two different things. One is asset investment that, and the other one, but the, the, the boom we had in the last two years, unfortunately, everybody sees as NFT as an asset. But it's not actually pure asset. It's also how you love the piece, how, how you love that piece of art, or uh, do you want to have it? Do you want to showcase it? Do you want to uh, give it as a gift to your niece or whoever? We cannot always materialize that one because uh, I'm sure everybody has art at home that they cannot sell it anymore or the artist didn't make it. You go to an art gallery, you see a great artist, great work, and the artist decides after two years to give up. You bought it for 5,000 euro, and you will never be able to sell it to that price, maybe a few hundred bucks as a garage sale or something, somebody would pick it up. But if you put it in any online trade market for art, it wouldn't jump out like uh, immediately. That's why art is in long-term investment. NFTs showed us how great they can be, but still I would say it's a long-term investment. And people who buy NFTs, I would always recommend also love it, also like it, be, be touched with it, because uh, it may be like now that a lot of things are not sellable, but it's, it's the same as the financial markets. I don't want to put it different. I have stock that now I see all zeros, and I didn't know when these companies went off the uh, New York Stock Exchange. I just see my E-Trade account that this bunch of zeros, and they're gone, uh, no value. It could be the same if you look at it as, as, a, as a kind of financial investment. So I would prefer to put it as a, a art. Okay, so our panel is about the misconceptions of NFTs, and I think education and communication is a very large part of removing these mis misconceptions. And Ricky, you're a marketer, you're a marketing expert. Can you tell us how, from your point of view and from your po company's point of view, can we maybe have a better communication about what NFTs are and what one can do with NFTs? Uh, that's a good question, actually. So, um, you see, it's, the information is always out there. You just type a few words in Google and you can get a lot of information. But what we at Bid.com find is that um, the messaging out there is too technical, it's too much, and it's, it's too saturated, uh, if you will. So what we, we're trying to do is to make crypto not just accessible, but simple. You know, crypto trading made simple. It's like, if I'm not a trader, I want to learn about trading. If I go to a platform, uh, like say, for example, you, use, you come to our, a blog, and it's, it's like, how to trade crypto. And you're gonna read like a couple of paragraphs. I don't know about most people here, but for me, myself, if I read too much uh, and something's too technical, too dry, I just lose interest. And then what I prefer, and I guess especially the younger generation, what we call the TikTok generation, they prefer uh, information in small doses in videos, and that's what we try to do. We try to bring crypto education to a different level by just producing short videos, uh, let them understand, and then, after they read those videos, if they want to learn more, then they go and read. I think that's a better direction and approach uh, as compared to what is currently out there in the industry. Yeah, and I think it also a lot depends on your target group. So as a company, everyone should think, okay, who is actually my target group? If you say it's the TikTok generation, then of course you cannot print out like PDF reports with charts and stuff like this. That's exactly true. So, uh, I mean, we, we, still, we do still put out uh, those content because we have um, users of all different levels of trading, uh, in maybe like novices to experts. So, of course, we still put out that content, but like I said earlier, it is about letting people have access to simple information, and if they want to get into, in, dive in deep into it, then they can go and read stuff and learn a bit more about it as well. Great. So, guys, we concluded our questions, but now maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Are there any questions? I cannot see so much from here. Yeah, we have a question here. Yeah, coming. Hi, thank you. From the perspective of uh, marketplaces, what would you tell us? Open question. Okay, that's a, quite a tough question. This is, uh, we have experience with all of them, 
and uh, none of them is actually supporting properly the traditional art movement to digital. They're not supporting easily the artists. There is a few platforms, artists only. They don't accept in projects. I think the marketplaces in NFT, and we, we have been talking also to Bit.com team since we're, we are new to that and they're opening it new. We are trying to talk to most of them. I think there is a huge gap for marketplaces to take serious that until now it was just a NFT drop. People would buy it. They would charge a lot of commissions. They would charge a lot of transfer fees and everything. And now the time somehow is stopped and I'm very happy because of that, that hopefully they look into what artists need. And we are talking about digital artists, offline artists, both of them, because there are no tools easily for them. Because when you, when you put something in, in any of the big ones, I don't want to name them, you are totally lost. I mean, for, for, for an artist that till now it was in an atelier doing their great work and there was only one gallery in his city that was buying the art, and now you bring him to a worldwide uh, global opportunities and you don't support them at all, it's really tough. And, and that's why, and, and if you look at all, the, all of them, there is no categories of art at this moment that, that, that can even uh, make different social media platform for it to support it. We hope they will change. Our initial idea was also under RTQ to launch a marketplace after we have seen how much work it is and we have already enough on the plate. We decided not to go. That's why we are trying to negotiate with most of them. Today I was very happy to see a lot of exchanges here that they have also their, their, their uh, marketplaces that to try to convince them to work with people like us that we are doing onboarding every day. In the, in the last one year, we onboarded 370 artists. That they came, we did classes, we teach them how to do it. Uh, we have also local galleries that we are turning it half NFT, half traditional, and that would be uh, the best thing. But very, very good question, and I hope they are listening, most of them. And then well, we, we do a little bit of change into bringing artists into the market. Thank you very much. And yeah, this is the end of our panel. Thank you very much for being here and uh, listening to the panel. And thank you to my fellow thank panelists. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you to everyone. Thank you.